The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Let's pray because uh, I believe the word of the Lord is, is about the spiritual abs. God's basically saying that all the scripture he's been giving is that he's working on the church to make ready a people prepared for what's coming in the days ahead. And my responsibility, as along with all other fivefold ministers, are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, how to prepare them spiritually. And so I think it might end up being a series, but uh, I want to cover something that's not taught enough, although it is taught, and that's how to hear from God. Not that you must hear from God, because anybody can say, my sheep hear my voice, I'm his sheep, I hear his voice. But the how-tos, I still say that is the missing link in the church. The practical application of how-tos. As a matter of fact, I've heard people even call how-tos merely saying stuff like uh, headings, like, well, the how-to is we need the blood of Jesus, the Word of God. Yeah, yeah, but that's not a how-to. That's, that's a list of items that are necessary. So let's make a distinction. I want to know how to experientially enter into the presence of God and continue that relationship. All true fruitfulness, this is worth writing down, all true fruitfulness comes from intimacy. You skip intimacy, and I don't really care what you say or do, it's not really going to accomplish anything. It has to come out of a relationship, not just out of religion. So um, hearing God more clearly would be the title of the message and perhaps even a series. And um, keeping in mind that I want you to hear God so clearly that you respond quickly. Um, those of you that didn't come to Tuesday, we talked on the difference between emotions and moods. How many have ever been in a mood? <laughs> a mood lasts, emotions can last seconds, minutes, hours. Actually, you cannot even prolong an emotion indefinitely. You'll get tired. Um, but a mood is like a weather pattern. It can linger for long periods of time. And uh, this is not the message today, but I'd just like to uh, give you this weather pattern of how it worked with me as a baby Christian. There was four major moods, the indicative, the imperative, the subjunctive, and the optative. And you go, what in the world is that? But anyway, here's the way it looks in life, all right? If I were to transfer through all of those moods properly, it would be get born again and I'm in the indicative mood. The sky is blue and the grass is green and wow, life is good. That's the indicative mood of a believer. And then you're excited, and God loves you, and you love everybody, and you expect everybody to love you, and then you find out that they don't all love you. <laughs> and then you start moving from, this is so good, this is so rich, everybody needs this, to where all of a sudden you see everybody's not receiving. And so you get a little pushy, and you beat them over the head with a Bible, maybe a little bit, or with words. So you went from this, the sky is blue and the grass is green, and now they're not listening the way they're supposed to. You get into the imperative mood, and you start getting into trying instead of trusting God. You're not flowing in the anointing now, now you're in willpower, and you're going to make it happen, because by golly, you're working for God now, all right? Then you get imperative. But you know what happens with the imperative? After you're in that mood for a while, you get weary. You get tired. And then you start going into another mood called the subjunctive mood. And that mood is where you start weighing out the pros. And, and, and when you, once you get into intellect and weigh out the pros and cons, the pros are very small little list and the cons are huge. And it's like, this is too hard. This Christian walk is too hard. I'm weary. Legalism, religion, and 
Then you just turn inward and you get mad, but you're tired of, you can't, you can't stay angry for a long period of time because you'll get tired, so you're already tired, so what do you do? You take that anger and you turn it inward. What's that called? Depression. And then there's only one mood left. I'm depressed. I'm a Christian. Uh, nobody asked me for prayer. I, don't, I can't understand why. <laughs> nobody listens to me anymore. Poor me. I'm depressed and I feel bad. Oh, oh. whatever happened to that abundant life? I don't know. <laughs> I don't see you have to have it. I got the joy. I just try faith. I got the joy of the Lord by faith. By faith, I got the joy of the Lord. Nobody else wants what I got. But I got it by faith. You're trying. You're depressed. And the weight of all of that heaviness is now an attitude. It's a disposition. It's like a weather pattern. And you're walking in this heaviness. I. You greet people and they go, oh, dear Lord. What, what, they brought a black cloud in with them. Oh, yeah. How you doing? Girl, great, great. Good, good. Which also is lying, but good, great. And there's only one way out of that. Somewhere. Somewhere there's got to be a light at the end of this tunnel. That's the optative mood. It's called hope, biblically. Biblically, all of a sudden, you've got to I feel like dying, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel, and I'm going to stay focused on it. And eventually, if you stay, you give power to what you give attention to, eventually you get out of it. Now, in the natural, they have grieving. But in the spirit, you basically have spiritual tools that you don't have to go through moods. I can remember them only for the teaching purposes of when I was a baby Christian. But quite frankly, after you grow up, moods are a thing of the past. And you need to process that through quickly. You can go from the indicative mood, life is good in Jesus, to repentance, to back into that life is good again. You can do it quickly. You don't need a long process. The long process is something that we've taken in inadvertently thinking that this too will pass. That's a bad idea. Don't wait for a mood to pass. It could stay there a long time while you're waiting for it to go away on its own. No, you take the initiative and repent and change the clothing. Put off the garment, put off the, uh, the mourning and the, and the heaviness for the garment of praise. All right? You can do that. Exchange. How do you exchange clothing? Repentance. All right, so that's your free part for those of you that missed Tuesday. You really needed that message, though, Tuesday. All right, but today's, start the cameras now. <laughs> today's is hearing the voice of God more clearly. Now, you know that we're his sheep, and the sheep hear his voice. And the way God speaks to us is through the Bible, the still small voice. He even speaks through creation. Uh, the audible voice of God, dreams and visions, angels, circumstances, inner assurance and peace. Sometimes you get an inner no, don't do that. And you know what I'm talking about, the conscience, the voice of your conscience. People, people can speak and you can feel the life that's on it. Revelation and illumination. Those are just some of the ways that God speaks. But the primary way is through intimacy. Intimacy with the living word. You've got the written word and you've got the living word. The living word is specific. The written word is the overall counsel of God. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to share some uh, apostolic prayers that I feel that we're coming into a time when we have the opportunity to respond to these apostolic prayers. And all of the apostolic prayers have to do with either seeing the kingdom or entering the kingdom. See or enter. Beyond that, you don't really need prayer. All of the prayer that Paul prayed was to bring you dimensionally closer to God, seeing what's in that invisible realm, just like those abs, <laughs> really ripped abs in the spirit, being strengthened by his spirit in the what? Inner man, right? 
that's in her woman too, right? All right. So here's the two scriptures that I want you to look at. Ephesians 1.16, it says that this is the Apostle Paul praying for believers. Now, he's praying for believers. He's, he's praying for them to have something that apparently he's walking in that dimension because you can't give something you don't have. But he wants you to come into that dimension that the God of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the Father of glory, might give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. What's He praying for? He wants you to have spiritual eyes to see. Spiritual wisdom and revelation in what? In the knowledge of Him. That you would know Him by revelation. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you might know what is the hope of His calling. What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? And what is that exceedingly greatness of His power toward us who believe? Uh, it's interesting to know that in 1 Corinthians 2, He's praying for us to have a spirit of wisdom and revelation to see, the wisdom to understand uh, the things of the Spirit. And I think what verse that really explains this concept is 1 Corinthians 2, verses 13 to 15, where it says, These things we also speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but what the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit, their foolishness even. nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man discerns all things. God's praying, the, apostle, uh, the apostles praying for a spirit of wisdom and revelation that you would know him experientially because once you have knowledge of him spiritually, then you can compare spiritual things to spiritual things. The spiritual man discerns all things. So if the spiritual person is comparing these revelations with other revelations, but it's going to appear as foolishness to the natural man. Now here's something <clears throat> that I saw that is necessary to understand, <clears throat> and that is that in the second apostolic prayer, that had to do with light and revelation. That had to do with See that invisible realm. I want you to see that invisible realm where Jesus is and see Him and grow in that sight. The second one is Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 19. And this one is, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of the Lord Jesus. He's praying for us again. He's bowing His knees. He's praying to the Father of our Lord Jesus, for whom the whole family in heaven and earth has been named. That, there's four that's. If you're a note taker, write down the four that's. That means why it's there for. It's there for that. That what? That. And sometimes I think when you're reading scripture, it's good to make a little note where it says that because it's pointing to why it's there. So why, why is he praying this prayer for us that uh, he, the whole family on heaven and earth has been named that? He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened by might in the inner man. There's your abs. He's praying. I want to see some spiritual abs in you people. You're getting fat. Okay? You're getting lazy. No. You're basic, he's basically saying that real strength is inner strength, not external strength. And he's saying that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened. That, so that the Father will strengthen you, your spirit so that you can carry what's coming. So you can even carry what's, what He's got for you. You see, your potential far exceeds your understanding because you, you still can be carnal in many ways. You can be affected by your culture. But God has deposited within you a potential that is unfathomable in the natural. You have to go to the Spirit to unpack I'm really into six-packs now, and really ripped abs. I hope that don't offend anybody, but it could be a six-pack of soda. I don't care. All right. But if he says, the reason that I'm praying, 
For this reason, I'm bowing my knees to the Father. For this reason, you're His reason, but He's seeing that you need something. You need, first of all, to see that invisible realm. And secondly, you need to enter in and start unpacking. That He might grant you according to the riches of His glory, so that the Father can strengthen you with His Spirit, so that you can carry what He's prepared for you. So say, say that out loud with me. I'm going to carry what He's prepared for me. I'm going to carry it. I can just like you carry those name tags up here, those weighty leadership tags, you carry them up here quite, quite aptly. Now, if you're strengthened by your spirit in the inner man, there's another that. That Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. So he wants you to be strengthened in your spirit to carry what he has for us. And the second that is that Messiah can settle down and make his permanent home in our hearts. We're going to carry that precious cargo. God wants to make his home in our hearts. So he's praying that you're strong enough to carry that precious cargo. That you're going to be that walking tabernacle of God, that living stone, that key that's going to unlock heavenly truths, that you would carry that, that Messiah might dwell in your heart so that Messiah can dwell down and make his permanent home in your heart. Now there's another that, that you, being rooted and grounded in the love of God, might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height, to know the love which passes knowledge. In other words, I really want you and I'm praying for you, this is the apostolic prayer, that you be strengthened on the inside, that Jesus takes up his permanent home in you, that you become a walking tabernacle of his presence, and that lastly, that you would come to know by revelation, not by information, not by study, that you would know by revelation the height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God. There's, it's there because what is a level that when I started my first church, God says, uh, level three is going to be real hard. You watch. People will not cooperate with level three. And level three was teach them, Dennis, their identity, that the new creation them loves God and loves his word. And that is the real you. You've got a lot of flesh that may contradict that. Nevertheless, the truth of the matter is you love God and love his word. That's the new creation. That's compatible. It loves God and loves the word. However, that, that new creation you that loves God and loves His word is to be a experiential knowledge of the love of God, the height, the width, the length, and the depth. And by the way, in Revelations, you know, the New Jerusalem, which is the corporate expression of us, not an individual, is a cube. And I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. This is the bride of Christ. The bride is like a cube. God is telling you individually, I want you to be a living stone that is equally balanced as a cube. The height, the width, the length, and the depth all being the same. That, you might know the height, the width, the length, and the depth. I got bad stories on how I learned that, but I don't want to bore you with all my mistakes. You want to hear them? <laughs> I can remember as a young Christian, the height, the width, the length of the love of God. And I was studying that and I was, ooh, I was loving it. Oh, it's a cube, yeah. And God was showing me, oh, Dennis, with the height, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're a worshiper. And oh, the depth. Oh, yeah, you, you, you're walking in victory. You got, you got people that have been in the church a long time coming to see you as a baby Christian asking for prayer. Oh, yeah, you got victory over the devil. It's, it's noticeable. People know that. You got, so you got depth. You got height. Oh, vision. I was giving all the other pastors to, that I wasn't even a pastor yet, and I was telling them vision for their church. All right, I was giving them vision. And so, oh, I have vision. I got enough vision. I was giving it to other people. As a matter of fact, I remember one pastor, I had the vision of the dome and eventually built the dome sanctuary, but had a vision of a dome that it was the corporate atmosphere. And, I, and one guy uh, was starting an apostolic network, uh, and it was called AIM, Antioch International Ministries. And he started out in his logo with a, with a circle. 
And I had such a reputation for input that all the other pastors in the room went, look out, Dennis must have had something to do with it. I see the dome there. I see the circle. Uh, Dennis is interjecting his vision on us now. So it was, but basically it was great vision. And then I saw the rest of my structure. He said, Dennis, you're like a tall, skinny skyscraper. <gasps> Yes, you worship this way. Yes, you got victory and depth. Yes, you got vision. But your width is putrid. Your width, uh, the slightest wind could blow you over. And I said, what's the width? Well, the width is carrying my presence when you cut the grass, when you go to work. And most importantly, it's those other people, even your enemies. Oh, the width is, you have to include people. Oh, oh! I just want to be me and Jesus. It was great, me and Jesus. No, it's those people, the width. Your structure is not a cube. Your structure is too skinny. The wind will blow it over. And I saw that the mundane activities of life and that there is both a horizontal as well as a vertical relationship with God. And to know the love of God, the height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God, it is also your attitude that you love God the way you love people. You love people the way you love God. So that's when the Lord told me to, when I planted my first church, He said, you'll see the, you'll see the struggle at the third level. First level is teach them their identity, that they love God and love the Word. Teach them that their gifts are available, particularly the Roman gifts, the motivational gifts, because let them love one another and you'll see what their gifting is. The gifts of the Father, motivational gifts, Romans 8, right? Then basically he said, okay, I taught them their identity to love God and love one another. I taught them, no, well, I taught them to love God and love his word. And secondly, their gifts and talents, which they like because that's all about them. People like to hear about their gifts because the focus is on them. Although your gifts are like fruit. They were meant to be given to somebody else. <laughs> but that's an additional point. But the third level was teach them their corporate identity. Oh, that's the place where I crashed and burned. Corporate identity was that horizontal aspect of being a believer. That means forsaking not the assembling of ourselves as some do. Hmm? It had to do with your attitude horizontally, your width. I think we got a lot of skinny skyscrapers in the church, don't you? Oh, they're great worshipers, they're gifted, they love God, level one. I love the word, love God. Love the Word. Love God. I'm a new creation. I have gifts. I've got gifts. I've got gifts. And that's level two. I've got gifts. i got gifts. Oh, they're wonderful. Look at me. Look at my gift. Okay. Level three. I love all of these people. Oh. I feel a mood coming on. Because God says... To know the height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God, I want to bring you into a corporate identity. You are individually members of one another. And the eye cannot say to the toe, I don't need you. And until that breaks through in an individual's life, you are limiting the Holy One of Israel. You're limiting God working in your life because you're, you're functioning as a lone ranger. Hmm. God's looking for people who will know their true identity in Him. They will also know that their gifting has to do primarily before your other giftings, before the gifts of the Spirit and before the ascension gifts, the gifts of Jesus. When he ascended on high, he gave gifts, apostles, prophets. But before all of that was Romans. And there is love gifts in there. And we're to love our differences and understand that people love differently. Can you identify how you love? If not, maybe you ought to start loving people and then you'll see what your gift is. Because you will do it a particular way according to those uh, Roman gifts. should do all of them, but motivational gifts have a tendency to, you kind of have a leaning toward one particular way. 
uh, what was the example I used to hear years ago? If I were to uh, accidentally knock my water glass off the pulpit, the one that's servanthood, a server who loves by serving and fulfillment would just come, get a dustpan, pick up the water. The teacher would come and say, Dennis, you need to know that step one, you never put the water bottle on the right hand. Step two, uh, <laughs> make sure it's got a lid. All right. The exhorter would come and say, oh, Pastor Dennis, that's okay. I've done it myself. You're okay. The encourager, the cheerleader, okay, the exhorter. The mercy person would come up. Oh, you must feel horrible that that happened. I can, oh, I feel your pain. I feel your pain. They're all loving me, but they're doing it the other way. And the leader, the leader type with them. I would have never done that. If I were in charge... I would see to it no one had a water bottle up on their pulpit. All right. All right. There's strengths and there's weaknesses to all of those. But just to give you an idea what it looks like, right? But God says, these apostolic prayers, and I also believe that there's been an unleashing prophetically, uh, literally around the world, they're saying the same thing, that there is a, uh, the apostolic fathers are being called to the forefront to build to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And I believe that. But I also believe that there are hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children will turn to the fathers. And God's going to send uh, people that want mentored seriously, they're going to come. The ones that want information, the one, some people will need to define mentoring. It's not about, at your convenience, someone's supposed to pour into you, but you don't have to do nothing in return. You know? No, no, no. This is a two-way street of give and receive. It's serving. It's participating. It's engaging in activity. Your real identity is that we are all called to royalty, but at the same time, we're all called to servanthood. Jesus himself, we're, we're not better than he is. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve. Leaders are supposed to be on the bottom serving the people, and the way to serve the people is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, not serve the people by making them, by enabling them to be forever children. Parents, you want your kids to stand on your own two feet? Equippers should want their congregation to stand on their own two feet. Feed people fish? We don't feed people fish here. We'll teach you how to fish for yourself. I don't think we've ever given even... Uh, in many cases, a financial handout because we've taught them instead to go see someone who can work with their finances to teach them how did they get that way. That's far more beneficial. The only time that I had an amusing call was I had a call from, oh, Pastor Dennis, do you know there's a person that's suffering in your congregation that can't pay their rent? And I thought, this is someone from outside my church. My church is pretty well informed of what's going on. I found out later that this, this concerned Christian was actually the landlord <laughs> wanting their rent. <laughs> so much for Christian concern, huh? I've seen it all. I've seen all those games that people play, but ultimately what God's looking for is a people that are going to learn to stand on their own two feet, that if God initiates something, He provides. You've got to be willing to admit you made some wrong turns and get back on your feet and start making some right turns. You made the bad decisions that got you where you were. I once had a, uh, an associate in my church that used to tell people they wanted, fi they wanted it fixed immediately, and he'd say, you didn't get that way overnight. You're not going to get out of that overnight. That's reality. There's a process of education that needs to be learned and how to appropriate it. But I want to make ready a people prepared for what God's coming. And he's basically saying, you've got to teach them to walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship one with another. But you've got to prepare their hearts <clears throat> to hear more clearly what God is saying. But here's the intent. What God wants is that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened so that the Father will strengthen our spirit to carry what he has for us. That 
Messiah can settle down and make his permanent home in us, that we can really experience the height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God. And that's going to include um, dying to that statement, I already know that. Whenever you say, I, don't, I already know that, you have just put a self-imposed limitation on your ability to move beyond. There are people, uh, especially uh, <clears throat> in the... Uh, that have been proficient at something who say I already know that actually they know it according to old school thinking they have difficulty getting outside of the box let's just pray that we don't put a ceiling on anything that God is trying to teach us and say I already know that whenever you say that's usually a bad sign I already know that means you've stopped going into depth and we're going to cover that from a scriptural point of view shortly but here's the thing that I wanted to get covered that fourth that that you being rooted and grounded in love might be able to comprehend with all the saints the height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God. So that, oh, there it goes again. All of these are preparation, building, instruction for entering into an invisible realm or the kingdom realm as opposed to the natural realm. That you and your entire being will be filled and flooded with the fullness of God. What does God really want for you? He wants the fullness of God. He wants you to be like, uh, who was that, uh, Smith Wigglesworth. He used to, before he preached, he used to say the same thing a lot of times. He used to say, flooded with God, flooded with God. Thank God I'm flooded with God. Wouldn't that be nice to be your confession all the time? Flooded with God, flooded with God. Thank God I'm flooded with God. Whew. That's walking in the fullness. That's got the spiritual abs in here. And that's that I might be square, but by golly, I'm a cube. <laughs> a height, the width, the length, and the depth of the love of God. I am no skinny skyscraper that the slightest breeze could blow me over because I don't know how to relate this way. Listen, this is one of the hardest truths to get through to the body of Christ spiritually. You, you, you treat God the way you treat people. You treat people the way you treat God. And don't tell me otherwise. Don't tell me you love God as these people. <laughs> yeah. You hate your brother, you're a liar. If you dislike. In the Didache, didn't we learn that? The early church was taught, even if you dislike, you need to repent. Uh, oh my goodness. This is strict. But God basically is saying, flutter with God, flutter with God. Okay. Here's something in preparation for Kingdom Life Church people particularly. Because if you really, really want it to grow, we get emails all the time from literally around the world who are watching all the YouTubes and saying, I'm learning so much. That is not the best way to learn. How many know what the best way are? The best way are. The best way is. What's the best way? Modules one through four. We labored for years training modules so that you could go step by step by step in a progressive order. And people are watching YouTubes from this concept and that kind con- like light bulbs and ornaments on a Christmas tree. You pull this one, you pull that one. You can learn, but that is the hard way. You really want to learn something, you get on that online school. You want to be a kingdom person that has some how-tos, someone that can actually begin to function to where you are a people helper, you skip modules one, two, three, four, and you skip the 60-day challenge. And quite frankly, you don't have anywhere near as much to offer as the the rest of the Christians. I say Brittany's so young, and yet because she's done all of the modules, all of the online school, plus the 60-day challenge multiple times, I'd stand her against any mature Christian who came out of Bible college because they'll have the right answers, but not necessarily the how to do it. Go up to any major leader, and when they preach a message, ask them, how do you do that? And you're going you're to get, you'll be stunned, because they've gotten so confident in the right answers, but not the application. And I don't ever want to hear some, any of my, have, just have faith, have faith. Most of the people, when you ask them to define, what did you mean by faith, it's not even faith. Get them to define it. Get them, how do you do that? Where does it come from? So, if you're one of those people and you're going to be a kingdom life person, you're going to be a full stature <laughs> It's one of the better-ites, all right? 
Here's something I want you to write down right now because you've got to understand this to prepare your heart to receive the Word of God, to really walk in a depth of a relationship with God that's meaningful, to really bear fruit, all right? Here it is. Our heart, when people say our heart, first of all, it's not the blood pumper, for please. <laughs> the bowels, the belly, the gut, in both the Hebrew and the Greek, it's here. All right, so get that straight. But in understanding that what we're going to get into in the days ahead is we're going to start training you to hear God's voice more clearly, and we're going to take baby steps, and we're going to go granular. But this is a foundation that you must have prior to that, knowing, first of all, that God wants you to see this invisible realm, and He wants you to enter this invisible. All of the apostolic prayers are about seeing this realm and entering it more fully, okay? Maturing, all right? Here are... When we use the word heart, first it's the parts of the soul, mind, will, emotions, plus conscience, which is in your spirit, conscience. That's the inward part of your being. Now, this will be foundation for everything we teach on how to hear God. And we'll cover a, a lot of the, uh, the, the scriptures on, on hearing God, hearing the voice of God. We, we already mentioned earlier, there's all different ways to hear from God. But the Spirit is the real, all inner knowings. Write this before I even get to the rest of it. <laughs> all inner knowings are primarily seeing, hearing, and touching in the Spirit, not your head. Inner knowings, subjective experience, is seeing, hearing, and touching. See, hear, touch. See, hear, touch. See, hear, touch. In the spirit is different than seeing with your eyes, hearing with your natural ears, and touching with the physical senses. So when you know in your knower these three, you're entering into the spirit realm. Remember, the spiritual man discerns all things. This is foolishness to the natural man because he's operating in his five senses. But in the spirit realm, there is inner knowings, inner seeing, and inner touching. All right, now we're going to get to it. We know all about the parable of the soil, the hearing heart. Take heed how you hear with the measure you use. But here is the foundation that that won't work for you until you see this and understand this foundation. Mind, will, and emotions plus conscience is the inward being. That's the inward being. That's a, the heart is spirit, mind, will, and emotions. All of that. That's your heart. The whole ball of wax. Spirit, mind, will, and emotions. Conscience is the voice of your spirit. That's why we're using conscience. When you, have you ever just been minding your own business and all of a sudden down in the gut it went, eh. That's like, mm, don't do that then if you feel a, mm, and maybe some of you need some barnacles off of that sensitivity instructor down there called conscience. All right? So, here's the foundation. Conscience needs to be pure. Hebrews 9, 14, and 10, 22. How do we get our conscience clean? Through the blood of Jesus. Having been sprinkled, our conscience clean. So you want to hear the word of God. If your conscience is not clean, you're going to get all messed up. I have people all messed up all the time telling me what God told them. And I know God didn't tell them that. But their conscience wasn't clean. So they heard it. How many of you remember? Memorize this one. Ezekiel 14.4. If any man come to the prophet... With an idol in his heart, I, the Lord, will answer according to the idol. What's that mean? You have an idol in your heart, you're going to hear a distorted answer. God's basically saying, you, you want to hear the voice of God. If your conscience isn't clean, you're going to hear it with a twist. 
So the conscience needs to be a pure heart. How about your mind? 2 Timothy 1.7, God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but power, love, a sound, disciplined mind, a sober mind. You have to have a mind that is sober, not running all over the map, helter-skelter and anxious and runaway thoughts. Don't, don't, don't expect to hear the voice of God because it's, it's like a wild horse. It's running wild. During that time, I don't trust anything you get from God. Neither should you. You need a pure heart conscience, a clean conscience, a sober, stable mind. Don't hear from God in the middle of the night when you've been up all night worrying about something. Because you'll you, you come up with ridiculous conclusions. Loving emotions. John 14, 21. So for me to hear properly from God, I need a clean conscience, washed by the blood, forgiveness. Cleanse me, O God, from anything other than your will and your word because I love you and I love your word. I'm a new creation that loves God and loves your word. I need to have a pure conscience. I need to have a sound, sober mind that no matter what I think, nevertheless, I want your thoughts because they're higher than my thoughts. Your ways are higher than my ways. That'd be the next thing, loving emotions. If you hear the voice of God and it's got condemnation, it's intrusive, that is not God. For heaven's sakes, test those voices by the Spirit. It always, even a corrective word should have the love of heaven behind it. My Father loves me. And if He corrects me, it's loving correction. You hear correction that's mean, angry, that's not God. The way people live in condemnation and it has nothing to do with God. You did it all by yourself. Even spiritual warfare. It's your own carnality beating you up. It's not spiritual warfare. You've got a sign on, you kicked me. Devil can take advantage of that because he goes, sure, why not? <laughs> although, although, even the demons would basically go, but quite frankly, you're doing a good job by yourself. Huh? That was my first revelation when I was a young, well, I, I just started pastoring and I was having a little pity party. And God showed me a little mini vision. It was like a cartoon, a little red devil with a pitchfork <laughs> holding the shovel. And he handed me the shovel. To, and as a kid, I babysat my two sisters. I must have watched every old-fashioned cowboy movie that ever existed. And the one thing they had in common that I really hated was the fact that before the bad guy would shoot the good guy, he would hand them a shovel and tell them to dig his own grave. How indignant. If you're going to kill me, you dig the grave. Or just leave me lay here. What good is it? Why would I work up a sweat digging myself? And the Lord showed me, Dennis, that's exactly what you're doing. The devil handed me a shovel and had self-pity on it. I was digging a depression that was eventually going to be at the tomb of self-pity. And you know what snapped me out of it? I got mad at evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. I hated the way those bad guys would always have the good guy. So apparently I was the good guy in this thing. But the devil, I was working for him. How many of you are working for the devil? How many of you, when he hands you that shovel of self-pity, you start digging. You start digging a depression, which will eventually become a tomb. So what I saw was that any, anything that I hear in my head that is not have any correction, that does not have the love of God behind it, I'm not taking it. I say, that's not me. And I'm not going to be digging myself and have the devil laugh at me saying, I don't even have to work hard on this one. I just hand Dennis the self-pity shovel and he digs his own little depression. And by the way, that's a mood. And you can stay there a long time with poor you. Trouble is, most people don't want to come to that party. We had a third grader tell us that, right? When we did the school, the children's school. <laughs> we said, it's a pity party. And they go, yeah, nobody wants to come to that. <laughs> did, you ever, did you ever want to hang around someone that was in self-pity? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -mm. Well, maybe the mercy people. <laughs> they don't know any better sometimes. That's a weakness of mercy. Oh, but really all they're identifying is with their own. Yeah, me too. Yeah, why, don't we, why don't we jump off the bridge together? Yeah. That's the wrong use of mercy, unsanctified mercy. And that's not ministry. <laughs> Helping take somebody down. All right. So when you get corrected, it should be loving. And lastly, a submissive will. Even Jesus made a good... You can make good choices or bad choices with the will. A submissive will is like Jesus did in Gethsemane. Oh, if there was possible to take this cup from me, so be it. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. A submissive will. So in, in the days ahead, uh, probably should repeat this often, but I want you to have that as a foundation. You will not hear God unless those four things are intact. You will, it'll be a twist to what you hear, and you're not going to be sure what God said. You need to have a clean conscience. You can't be busy judging yourself and say, I think God's telling me to, you know, uh, sell my wife, sell the car, sell my husband, sell. <laughs> it's probably not God, all right? Probably. A clear conscience. You're in a state of forgiveness, self, toward God, toward others. Your mind is stable. You're not, it's not all over the map. It's submitted. Your emotions, love. And what we've taught in this church that brought so much success in changing people's lives, forgiveness is instant. Restoration is a process. And to not confuse the two. You don't know the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. You will be confused. Reconciliation is a process. It actually requires two people. Forgiveness can be unilateral. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You didn't wait for a response. Forgiveness is instant. And if you do not deal with the emotions... You are a walking time bomb. You are not a mature Christian any more than your emotions allow. You cannot be more spiritually mature than your emotions allow. You cannot be more spiritually mature than your emotions allow. Spiritual maturity and emotional maturity are just about synonymous. Remember we talked about the guy in the Golden Dawn, the three-piece suit? And he was upset with Golden Dawn's service. And he stood on his tiptoes and his face got beat red. And he went, I wouldn't buy nothing from this store ever again. No, neither should any one of you people ever buy anything from this store. Jennifer and I looked at each other and said, emotional damage, age three. Huh? I don't care what his intellect was. An intellect without the emotional support of the love of God is just an accident going somewhere to happen. Mind, will, and emotions are like three bad kids and they're off doing whatever they want to do. They need to be subordinate under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So how many parts do you have to your heart? Spirit, mind, will, and emotions. If you know those parts, you know that all of those parts have to be submissive to the Lord for there to be any kind of clarity with real revelation. Otherwise, your revelation will be tainted by whichever one of those four pieces is not functioning under lordship. You go to any Baptist, evangelical, charismatic Bible school, and they'll tell you there's no such thing as repentance that does not include the volition or the will, the emotions, a godly sorrow, and the mind changing. Changing the thoughts, the will, and the emotions. All three must be submitted or you do not have clarity. You can't just say the right answer. God is looking for a people that are going to be flooded with God, flooded with God. Thank God you're flooded with God. <laughs> but these four elements, if they're not cleansed and washed, anything that I'm going to teach from here on about hearing the voice of God, without those four being understood, they need to be clean and under the Lordship of Jesus. I don't trust your hearing from God. 
I never trusted anybody who said they, in the church, they, charismatic churches now, they throw around the word discernment. Anyone who's upset has zero discernment. Upset is not discernment. If you're upset, you're judging. Discernment comes out of abounding love. Let your love abound, Philippians 1.9. Let your love overflow in all real knowledge, experiential knowledge, and all discernment. And the spiritual man discerns all things. Let your love overflow. Matter of fact, that's an apostolic prayer too. Let your love overflow in all real wisdom and judgment. You know what that's saying? If those four elements, a sober mind, a conscience that's clean, a will that's surrendered, uh, emotions that have love based behind it, controlling it, the love of God controlling it, then basically when you love, you will not love foolishly. Did you know that you can love foolishly? I think the culture's doing it real well right now. They love everything. They even love sin. <laughs> But you can love foolishly. What would Jesus do? I hated that statement because that's only a half truth. What would Jesus do scripturally? You should know that. But in every little, it's not a product of your imagination as to what Jesus would do. You need to be prompted by the Spirit. You need to have God initiative, not your good idea. God is looking for to give us light, to walk as children of the light, to walk in the light as He is in the light, and enter into that realm. I think that's enough for preparation. You've got to have those four elements down or everything that follows. Because here's where we're going to go next. We're going to go Matthew 13, 9. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. He's not talking about these kind of ears. All revelation. Take heed how you hear. Fifteen times in the New Testament, Jesus probably stated it so many times that 80% of your life is communication one way or another. Yet, one of the least taught subjects is listening, spiritually. How to hear. Not that you should hear, how to hear. And I really want to get into that because I'm, I'm saying that God is basically looking for like the four soils. He knows that take heed how you hear with the measure you use, with the depth that you hear. Not I already know that. And I'm also going to pray right now for those watching by YouTube, which there's far more that are being schooled that are out of state and out of the area uh, by YouTube. I really want to encourage you, if you want to learn quickly and lay a proper foundation, it's not just all the YouTube videos. The best way is modules one, two, three, four, and they're numbered that way specifically to take you sequentially into a deeper, richer relationship. The online school, team online school. I mean, you've been in church, in many cases, years and years and years. Wouldn't you like to let, make sure there's no cracks in the foundation? And wouldn't you like to be able to hear any teaching and know exactly where to put it? Modules one, two, three, four. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.